field. So if you start to get prompted to call certain people or visit certain people, and after the phone call or after the visit or whatever, you have relationships that we start off with, so to speak, and formulate during our life, are there's guilt in them. They're, there's guilt. Even though they have their good times, they have their bad times and their guilt. So now the Holy Spirit is saying, okay, the way out of this is, it's like a fresh start, you know. It's like actually going inside and thinking about all these people. You can think about that woman in particular and these other people. And literally handing them over to the Holy Spirit and saying, you know what's best for them. I, I'm not going to keep taking the responsibility for their happiness and their welfare on myself. I give them over to you. And uh, also, you want to inspire me to have guilt-free relationships. And, and those are the symbols that come to you when you're open and serving the Holy Spirit. You get witnesses of that love and that openness. I mean, it's gone for me from being a very shy child, I was shy all the way through grade school, junior high, high school, shy all the way through university. Uh, most of the 10 years of university I was very shy. And then suddenly, you know, I finished those 10 years of university, A Course in Miracles comes into my life and I start going to, after two or three years of reading it just on my own, listening to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, I started going to groups, I started opening my heart up, and I started being ego frightened, like, whoa, this is really threatening. After all those years of quiet and shy and isolating, suddenly it was like, like the floodgates were opening up in a hurry. And then, as I just went with it over the years, that was probably, I started traveling about 1991, so that's about 17 years now, Oh yeah, I, I just let the Holy Spirit bring me floods of witnesses of, of love and joining and laughter and happiness in 21 different countries. So the floodgates more than opened up. <laughs> the flood came and it kind of cleared away these things. And the things that most people go through, I mean, people will talk to me and they'll say, well, I've got to go to my, my 25th high school reunion or things like church classmates, churchmates, childhood friends, and all, all those kind of things that most people deal with that, that involve a certain amount of guilt. Uh, those are gone from my life. I mean, my friends, they're all like vibrational friendships. Mm -hmm. That's how I know them, is through this vibration. Mm -hmm. We were literally brought together by the Holy Spirit, and those relationships are just flourishing and, and multiplying. It's like a like flowers in a the garden, they're just blooming and blooming and blooming, and there's more seeds and there's more and more and more. And if somebody said, would say to me, when was the last time that you saw or talked to like a classmate of yours that you went to school with? I'm like, what? I can't even, uh, I don't even have a, a space in my memory for that. It's probably decades, uh, actually. Uh, what about your, your church that you grew up in? I mean, what about those people there? I was back there once, but the Holy Spirit came ripping through, and it was a very mystical experience, but it had a lot of people that I had known were going on, and there's not a lot of continuity in those kind of ways. Um, even in spirituality, if somebody took did a time-lapse photography of this peace house that I founded back in 1996, you would see all these different characters coming and going. And including this body, because I was off on travels, you would just see a time-lapse photography, like a collage of all these different people. It wouldn't be like a, a one person or two or three that are there. The faces have changed so much. Even in my work with The Course in Miracles, the faces have changed. And in fact, since about 1998, the only things that have been stable at the house have been my two cats. I, I, I had these little cats, uh, and, and one of them even left when Kirsten and I were on seven months of travel, the one cat angel uh, left. But her sister Tripod, the three-legged cat, um, <laughs> she looks like she's from another planet. She, you look into these eyes and it's like, where did you come from? And I always tell her, it's good that Spielberg never discovered you, because you would be in one of his movies. It would be another E.T. If, if anyone ever saw that face. But she's, she's kind of a quiet little mystical, uh, three-legged cat. She's she's happy to purr and she's not into show business. She's not into show business. She's not. And then 
And then another cat showed up when we were just taking off on that trip, named Sam. And it, he was about ready to be put to sleep by the owners who were moving out of the front house. So he came up and rubbed him on the leg, like, need a home quick. <laughs> we're talking today. And, and, we had, and we were leaving for seven month trips, so we said, okay. And there was a guy there who was going to record two CDs at the house while we were gone. And Sam's been pretty much a fixture ever since then. He's, he lives in the moment, and he comes out from outside, comes in, and looks at you like he's never seen you before. Like, who are you? What are you doing in our house? And he'll like walk from the, the tile up to the carpet, and he'll just like uh, the carpet, like the living room carpet. He just as if he's never seen the carpet before, and he, or if he sometimes wants to jump on something, he just stays and he keeps looking down at it as if he's wondering if it's solid or not, like if it's man. He's so in the present moment sometimes that he just gets this look on his face, like he's completely blanked out all the time in his face, and he's just totally in the present moment. So it's like even the cats start to reflect our purpose, our state of mind. And they've been more the fixtures uh, than anything else. Even the faces have come and gone at the peak house. So, so you get more into the purpose, and you, you put less faith in the appearances, you know, it's like you're ready, you're opening the door, and whoever's at the door, you're going to greet them with joy. Mm -hmm. uh, the phone rings and you, you speak with happiness and joy. Uh, whether you seem to have a history or not, um, it doesn't really matter, you know, it's like you're in the purpose of, with the Holy Spirit of Jesus there. So, it's very welcoming, very loving, and, uh, and also when you're with people, it feels like you've known them forever. Like you just you know, we've known each other forever, even if you just met, you know, for two or three minutes, you know, always there's this strong feeling of, of recognition, like, I know you, oh yeah, I remember <laughs> you, and it's very strong, it just becomes stronger and stronger, and you learn to let go of the other stuff, I mean, um, I always have had the philosophy that everything is either a miracle, or a miracle waiting to happen, so there's no room for grievances, or uh, lost souls, or whatever. I mean, if, as I've gone on in my pathway of joy, I just have a, a, like a joy surrounding me all the time. And it's like that Charlie Brown character, Pinkpen. You know, where Pinkpen was always dirty, and there was always a big puff of <laughs> dirt falling. I'm kind of in a cloud of joy, so there's a cloud of joy around me. And, and anyone or anything that seems to be not a part of that joy, they really can't even get very close to me. It's almost like they can't penetrate the cloud of joy. There was, there was some guy one time who was, who was a very kind of a threatening, menacing kind of character in the world's terms, leading mess, voice messages and saying kind of like, when you get down here to Florida, I'm gonna, I'll meet you out in the parking lot. Like he's gonna beat me up in the parking lot or something <laughs> like this. And, People around me were like, what, are you afraid? And I said, afraid? What do you mean? We got down to the Harmony Church, we were in the parking lot where he was making all of his threats that he was going to do harm and everything. And I had people that traveled for states to come and see me, and we just had the biggest hub fest in the parking lot of Harmony Church, and then we had a glorious gathering. And I said, yeah, that's the way it's kind of like this big loud joy that, that uh, they said he was revving his motorcycle out in the parking lot after we were talking. It's like, yeah, I kind of remember something, but I can't, it's like it doesn't even reach my awareness anymore. Because you get into the state of joy, and then you see a joyful world. And you don't have hecklers. You certainly don't have any enemies. Uh, like Jesus teaches, you know, if you, if you believe you have an enemy, you have a great need of prayer. You have to pluck the enemy out of your own mind. It's not like they're really external enemies, but they're, they're enemies in consciousness. When we have grievances that we hold on to, those are the enemies. We just have to pluck them out and hand it over to the Holy Spirit. So I find that, uh, yeah, a lot of the people that I seem to have interacted with through the early years of the parable of David have disappeared. It's almost like they disappeared and they were never there. Uh, and I certainly don't feel any guilt uh, I've got such a full life of joy that I'm not even thinking it. And when people would even say to me, oh, have you, have you seen so-and-so? 
whatever happened to so and so? You know, those kind of questions. <laughs> and, they, and where is so and so? They come up to you, you haven't talked or spoken to the person maybe for three decades, and they come up and they say, Where is so and so? They say, They're in my mind. How are they doing? They're doing great. Uh, because you start to realize that your mind is everything and that everything and everyone is in your mind. And of course, if you're doing great, that means they're doing great. And you can answer with confidence. Even if you haven't spoken to them for three decades, you know that they're doing great. Are they still alive? Uh, I, I guess so. I'm alive. Uh, in the spirit. You know, all those things that seem important in the world. Where are they living? How their life is going? Are they living? Can they pass on? You know, just those things all disappear. And there's no guilt. It's very free. Yeah, it's a nice perspective. It's beautiful. <laughs> Except David, I'd say, um, if it's a parent, they're not going to disappear from your life, even though they may be um, having opposite feelings about spirituality. And I know if I spoke to my mother, like you did with your mother, even though I was trying to say it respectfully, I know she'd just think I was cuckoo and I would, I would feel horrible. But they basically, I mentioned the other day, they, they turned around and they just started reflecting my joy. And then uh, my father did seem to pass on and uh, my mother still, you know, we just have get together for lunch and everything. And there's not so much frequency of contact just because this body is being used by the spirit in different, four different continents. And, and yet, it's like we don't miss a beat, you know, there's, there's a, a joy there. But it can seem that way. I mean, I've had uh, a friend of mine was years ago was in prison, had a child in prison, and was uh, kind of hooked up with this man who was into drugs, a drug dealer. And I remember when she got out of prison, I think her and her partner had robbed a bank or something. When she got out of prison, she just was could feel him being involved with drugs and just could feel her life kind of being sucked back down into a very dark place. Uh, and she she did pray, and she just got down to her knees and she said, please God, I know I've gone off, something's going, I can feel it's going way wrong again in my life. And uh, she prayed for God to lift her up and help her out. And then this man, uh, they found him hanging uh, in the attic, I think, uh, the next day. She's not even sure whether it was some connection with the mafia or Coming yourself, and I said, Well, that's immaterial. You know, you were making a prayer for, for your life to turn around, and people sometimes can take guilt on this. Like, I pray for help from God, and my partner hangs themselves, and I'm not supposed to feel guilty. I said, Heavens, no! They're just symbols, they're just images. What would you want if this is an attack top? You want it hung up there, or, or and taken out of your life, or not? You know, you've got to quit thinking of people as people. Uh, these are all just symbols. And it's the same with parents, you know. I had a woman down in Florida, and she had this white curly hair, and she was like, she would tell me the story where she said, I was flowing along in my life, and everything was perfect in my life. Everything was perfect. And I'm reading my course book, and, and then I said to God, Holy Spirit, you know, I have everything that I could ever want. I'm so grateful for everything, for this mind training. And, the only thing I would want that I don't have is I would want, I want a deeper feeling with my husband. I want a feeling of closeness, like we share everything. I want a feeling of deep love and connection. It's the only thing that's not perfect. So if there's any specialness in my relationship with my husband, please take this from me. That's the only thing I want. And so about a month went by, after she made her prayer, she said, I want a holy relationship with my husband. That's my only prayer. A month went by and her husband was diagnosed with a tumor, uh, and the tumor began growing a month earlier when she had made the request uh, for a holy relationship. I always tell this story because this gets rid of the appearance things and thinking, you know, what a holy relationship is or how it has to look. So, so as soon as she prayed for a holy relationship, the tumor started growing uh, in her husband. And, and it progressed and progressed and progressed, and his health went down and down. And she had all this. She had been a nurse and she'd done all this respite care training. And she said, honestly, I took care of him, I, I bathed him. We had I, we started talking as his illness seemed to progress. We had more heart-to-heart -heart talks. It went from all this surface stuff, talking about the weather and this and that, to 
really having these deep heart to heart talks, deep communication of saying, yeah, this coming is not in the form that you imagine, but, but this deep connection. She felt closer and closer and closer. And she worked with this man and loved him and cared for him and bathed him and all the way. And then a year to the day after she had asked for a holy relationship with her husband, he died. <laughs> and so I said, wow, that was a, a great lesson. And then she said, and then my husband died and I said, I, got, I can't stay in this house, I have to move. And so she, she looked around and she said, I had no place to go. So she, she said, I moved in with my mother. So she said, I moved in with my mother about a few weeks later. And I went there and she had this vicious dog, man. It was a ferocious dog, it was growling, screaming, biting. It was, it was just this vicious dog, man. And so I said, well, what did you do? She said, I said, Holy Spirit, I need a holy, I pray for a holy relationship uh, with this dog. And I always tell this, I tell this parable all over the world and the people go, she killed the dog too. <laughs> Dog, and the next day she went back and the dog was as passive and kind and gentle as could be. And her mother should be better. What did you do to my dog? <laughs> but this is what I mean. You don't you know the form. Uh, it's the content. And and people are, are really just thoughts. And so it's like all this guilt comes from thinking of people as people. And somehow you have to maintain these associations. And we've all known that we've had experience when sometimes somebody has passed on and we felt closer to them uh, after they passed than when they were there in the flesh. And it's all a state of mind. It's just that we have to loosen ourselves from thinking about people as people. Because there's always going to be guilt when we are associating them with bodies. You know, could I have done more? Could I have communicated more? Could I have been a better friend, a better partner, a better lover? Could have, would have, should have. Guilt, guilt, guilt. You know, things could have been better. I could have done more. And everyone who walks this world with an ego, self-concept, they, they, Jesus says they, they count the good and they count the bad. And they hope that there's more good to offset the bad. Everybody who's walking this earth is kind of going, keep it score in their mind. <laughs> Am I going to make it back to heaven? <laughs> I've done all the bad. Have I done enough? <laughs> Good. If I give it enough to charity, if I've been kind enough with, with the animals and the people, you know, as if like somehow God's going to judge you in the end. But God isn't a judge. God is th this beautiful being that knows you perfectly as you were created. And the Holy Spirit is just the bridge that's working in your mind to clear away all this guilt. And it helps to be able to talk openly about these things because it just gives your mind a different perspective on relationships. And you start to say, when people leave your life that were very negative, uh, you don't have to say, oh my God, I let them down, or I could have done more. Those thoughts are disappearing for a reason. And when you meet people that are happy and joyful in your life, they're reflecting your own desire to wake up. Uh, of course they're there. You know, they're symbols. They're witnesses. You should feel good when you have loving people starting to surround you in your life. But it's, it's all, you know, very basic and practical. It's all very mental. It's all mind. Yeah. And the school of miracle in the process. Um, I went to the course, I went to other days. I was just a report to mind that they were just going to go see these. She said, do you know this is yeah, the story of miracle impulses, I use the, the metaphor of like, like a prism, where you have this beam of light coming down to the prism, and then when the light moves through the prism, it, it, sh it splinters the light into a rainbow of colors. And that's pretty much the way it works with the story of miracle impulses. That if you have an ego belief system, and the light is coming, coming up, and the light gets filtered through the ego belief system, it comes out, the light on the surface of consciousness, as cravings and wants and desires. So, when you want a piece of chocolate, 
um, and you crave a piece of chocolate, maybe with almonds or peanuts or something, or caramel or whatever, you're thinking of it, that's a distorted miracle impulse. That's really God calling. Uh, that craving for that chocolate is God calling. The craving for, for sex or for warmth, for different kinds of stimulations, for entertainment. You know, there are many things in this world that seem to be very important in the mind can become somewhat addicted to them, or, or they can turn into cravings. But really it's just underneath it is the light calling the mind back. So there's a miracle impulse, a very strong miracle impulse to return to the awareness of God. But once it comes through this ego lens, we'll call it, like the prism, which is a very fragmented lens, it fragments the call, or fragments the light, into all these cravings. Because the lens is the belief in scarcity. The lens is the belief in lack. So when you take this powerful impulse and you run it through the filter of lack, it comes out on the surface of human consciousness as, as a craving or a want. And it seems like it's very individualized. Like one person can crave one thing, another person can crave another. But really all the cravings are the same because they're all ego cravings. So but I see that. Like yeah. It's, all it does is, is the belief is that there's a craving, and that if you do something in the world, that temporarily it will satisfy the craving. So when people are, are hungry, or thirsty, or horny, or hot, or cold, you can actually seem to do things in this world that will satisfy the, the craving or the lack for a short period of time, and then it comes back again and again. And, and some of you remember that parable in the Bible where the the woman at the well wanders up and comes up to Jesus, and out of his word comes, out of his mouth comes the Holy Spirit. Drink of me, and you will never thirst again. You hear that? That's the miracle impulse. Drink of me, and you will never thirst again. And, and so, if you think of, that's what this bright light is. It's coming like a beam of light in your mind. Just drink of me, and you will never thirst again. And then it comes to the ego lens of lack and make him, I want a, I want a coffee, I, I need a tea, it's a hot day, I want a tall, cool glass of water. On the surface of consciousness for human beings, that's how it's coming out. So again, you're back to the same thing, inviting the Holy Spirit to help you clear away the lens of lack. And what happens when you clear away the, the lens of lack? You get a prompt, we'll call it a miracle impulse, call so-and-so. And, and so you call them and you have this delightful conversation. Your heart's open. They're telling you, thank you, I'm so glad you called today. You made my day. You're an answer to prayer, so on and so forth. When you answer those miracle impulses in a very direct way, that's what we call being a miracle worker. And when the ego lens is covering over those miracle impulses, then it seems to come out in the sense that you can do something with the body or do something with magic or something of the world that will just temporarily satisfy you and then that's the human condition and you get right back into that's why people work so much doing as Jesus says meaningless things so they can get meaningless uh, money and spend it on more meaningless things is because it's like craving satisfaction craving satisfaction it's like the whole world is just built to solve those cravings in a temporary way without ever getting to the roots of where the craving came from in the first place. So it all makes sense once you start to have the context for it.
would say things like, for those that have the ears to hear, let them hear. And people would hear parables on different, like they were so well designed that they could get different things out of them, depending on where their level of consciousness and awareness is. So, like for some people, I said, if, if you have a lot of difficulty with the Course, it may be a book like the last section of the Arantia book. Uh, the Arantia book is, the last section is the life and teachings of Jesus. It's a much fuller uh, picture of Jesus' life in great detail of his entire life. Unlike the Bible, where it's like, oh, we got a virgin birth, and then boom, he's 12. He's in the temple uh, saying to his parents, you know, don't you know I have to be about my father's business? And then kind of skips over all the teen years and the 20 years and boom, he's, he's 37 years old and he's walking around calling apostles. And then you go through three years which different versions of the Gospels highlight different aspects of those three years and then you've got a crucifixion and a resurrection. Very spotty. <laughs> the Gospels are very spotty. But they feel like there's really something to be learned from Jesus. So for me, Something like the Urantia book is something that I would recommend. Uh, I remember when I read through that last section of the Urantia book, it was, it was like if I could have had prayed for one full picture of a human life, it would have been for Jesus. You know, give me a full, full biography on, on Jesus' life. All the little details, you know, the, to fill in the gaps. How do you live this love? How, how do you live divine love? in a practical way with human beings. Not all this high ideas of abstract love, universal love. Show me the practical things. So I actually just had all these tears of joy just pouring through me when I was reading through that last uh, section because it was extremely practical. I mean, it was times like I was right there with Jesus. And it wasn't so much like the movies of Jesus because a lot of the movies throughout the history in particular you know, all the, like even the Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's movie, there's all this pain and suffering and sacrifice and everything, even from Jesus, or the last temptation of Christ, you know. It's kind of got him struggling, even on the cross, he's thinking of Mary Magdalene and imagining her and having kids with her and all this and that. It doesn't really paint a very divine picture of Jesus, it's more like he's just struggling to try to make it through and things in the Bible saying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was sweating blood. Mm -hmm. Wow, I mean, you've been listening to the Holy Spirit for three years and, and I'm the father of one and you've got to go sweat blood? It's like, it sounds terrible. Why would you guess it? Yes. Why would you want to follow the Holy Spirit if you've got to sweat blood in the end? But, you know, to me, those are the kind of things that I would just go, come on, can we have something a little more realistic? Well, the last section of the Urantia book is more realistic. Thank you, Papa. And you've been, Raj has one of those over. Mm -hmm. I've started. Started, 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 started right. reading it. Mm -hmm. And so, if you're heading like, with a course that's still not clicking, I would suggest something like that. Uh, for me, I had many steps before the course. Uh, the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus Christ was one of them. It was helpful. Um, a lot of different books kind of helping me open towards it. And then, by the time I got to the course, you know, my mind was, really so open and ready that it was a very joyful experience that I could read it for, you know, about eight hours a day. So, but still I didn't have resistance where the eyelids would get like lead weights, even for me, you know, at that point, like no more. Then I would just be gentle and it's, it's again about being intuitive with it. I've heard many stories around the world in different countries where people the Course comes into their life and then they know that it's for them, but maybe not just right now. So they use it as a, they put plants on top of it or they use it as a door stopper. You would be surprised at all the things. Some, actually, they're more like warriors, you know, warriors for Christ. They get in there and they work with it and the resistance is so strong and I've heard one of them tore each page out individually. Uh, threw it in the, the toilet or threw it in the river. I mean, you hear all these stories because you have to really be ready for this book. And if you're not ready, don't fight yourself, you know, just, just let the Spirit guide you to something where you have a sense of resonance and you have a sense of your heart opening, and it'll wait. It may fall off the shelf and knock you on the head after two or three years or something like, oh, I guess it's 
time, and you read it in the New York Huff, or people who even read it a lot, you know, they're, they're always saying, I, I can't believe you said that. I, Mm -hmm. I can't believe I've read this book that it's it's in there, you know, because it's, you're just ready for that particular idea, and there it is. It's just been waiting all along until your mind was. Sweet. I found that the um, Journey of Young Words by Frank Haskell, um, companion to the course, was very helpful for me. Because the terminology of the course was a bit overwhelming when I first started to, to read the course, but then the terminology of um, Jane Young was very simplified, very, very simplified, and it always reminded me of who I really was, which was the Son of God. And it kept on reminding me of that consistently, even when I would slip out of my mind, it would remind me of that. So then when I went to the course, I felt like it was easy to remember who I was because I'd already been reminded so I like what you said, I wasn't ready for the course at that time, even though I'd been sitting on my shelf for 10 years. I used so many tools underneath that, that derived from the course because it seemed so overwhelming. And then one day I picked it up and I was like, I don't know why that's never made any sense to me. Yeah, yeah there's, there's lots of symbols too. Uh, Gary Bernard's books, two mm -hmm. books, Disappearance of the Universe and Your Immortal Reality, that many people find who, who have had struggles with the course where they started to get apathetic with it or started to feel that the resistance was getting too strong, they find those books helpful because there's so many parables and examples that are included and still the metaphysics come through. So, so those can be helpful as well. Um, that was my feeling when I first saw this appearance of the universe. It's, uh, I've been teaching a lot of the subtleties that Art and Persa teach in that book um, for years. And I kind of laughed and went, ah, it's finally in print. Because I was not guided to copyright anything, but uh, here it was, Gary got the teachings, put it in a copyrighted book, and I said, oh, this is just going to make my job even easier now. You know, people read it, they get the metaphysics, they get some good, clear examples, and many people have told me they just read through that book, and then the course comes alive for them. Like it's, like it's been hidden behind some veils, or it's They've been in some dark chambers and then they pop through those and then they go up and all lights up again. So there's lots of, of ways, including our materials. I mean, I, I basically have been doing this for 17 years and when you listen to the CDs and the DVDs and, and read some of the materials, there's so many examples and I use so many metaphors and parables that it actually helps uh, clarify a lot of things. So it's like you're still getting the teachings, but you're getting them in a, in a context with many metaphors and examples. And uh, for a lot of people, I know Christians listen to a lot of the teachings over and over, probably hundreds of hours, and, and then Jason and different ones who have worked with me. Uh, they just, nowadays with MP3 players, are so small and portable, you can go about so many activities and just have the little MP3s going in there, and your mind is engaged, even if you're gardening, or taking a walk, or doing one
self-concierge because the whole thing was about this belief that there's this world outside of you that can just do you. And it was just amazing. Like by the time I got back to the house, it was like, wow. <laughs> yeah. They're like a night chain. You kind of, you know, get into a, like listening to a whole set and then I would have a break and then I'd have a question for them and I'd just press play and boom, they're asking my question. Yeah, it's, it's very joyful, but it's almost like if, if the mind is so deep that you need a guide to go down with, like someone to hold your hand and take the lantern with, it's just like going down this dark basement and having to go through all these dark crevices and caverns and this and that. And, and that's really what a lot of material is. I mean, I've done so many gatherings and they've been recorded. So people engage in those and it's like going down deeper and deeper, and you hear the questions, you hear the answers, and it takes you way down. Um, it was just this past year, uh, this man, Kelly Love, has been a friend of mine for years. The, in North Carolina, the United States, was where the first Course in Miracles group in the world was held. Um, Judy Scush went through, gave him a book, and they said, let's study it. Other than, uh, he, I can't, you can't even consider Bill, Bill Fetzford and Helen Shuckman the four, first group. They were the first two students. But they didn't really want to study the book or the notes, and Jesus had to dictate a lot, number of chapters and finally go, uh, I want you to study the notes. What? Oh, study the notes. You want me to actually study the notes? So they really weren't a study group. They were like this. But they had a group of people in North Carolina, and Kelly Wells was part of them. So Kelly's, this was back probably in the 1970s, so, so Kelly's been at this for probably over 30 years, and uh, I recently got word from him that he said, my wife is not a Course in Miracles student. She's had wanted nothing to do with the Course in Miracles, nothing to do with the book and everything. For 30 years, he's held with it. And he said, somebody sent us one of your, you might have it over there somewhere, San, San Pedro DVDs. And he said, she watched that San Pedro DVD. And she said, what is this book that you're studying? Uh, I want to find out more about it. This was like after 30 years of, of marriage, you know, just, it was just timing. But whatever she saw, the joy, the laughter, whatever was said on there, something connected. Something started to resonate. And to me, that's a great testimony. I said, oh, that's a wonderful little story that somebody just happened to get a hold of one of those DVDs and, and feel like, okay, I want to I wanna open up to this thing. And, it's all working together for the good. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. It's, is it important to do the Course of Miracles with the group? Because I found I tried, I had the book, and it, it was very heavy for me, very um, as a semi physical or concepts. And of course, I do that very well, but I don't get down into this area. So, so with. I've been doing a course in the way of the heart, which, which is, could you speak of that? Because I found that spoke to me. So well, that's what I need to go to There's many, many inroads. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I think, um, I think there, I think there, maybe there, wasn't there a group, I think right here in Brisbane, they started off as a, like a Course in Miracles study group, and then they started to receive a lot of my emails and my teachings, and so it kind of went from a Course in Miracles study group to an Awakening Mind slash Course in Miracles study group, and then, then it kind of turned into a support group where they decided, well, let's talk about our issues, let's make it practical, not just about theory and concepts, and so it kind of swung into like a very experiential support group for Awakening. And then they cleared away so much that it turned into a meditation group where they could, anyone could speak, but they basically just wanted to sit in silent communion. So that's kind of a progression. And I thought, I always remember that in that group here in Brisbane, that, that there are many, many inroads. And so it's what we were just saying, you do have to work with what resonates. And then you take a step inward. And Many people talk about this. They'll get up, start off with Eckhart Tolle, Power of Now, or Conversations with God, or The Way of the Heart. There's just many, 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 many inroads to it. And then as you go deeper, uh, your mind, as you, as you get more and more ready, you know, you, you're told about the next step, and it becomes apparent. But there's no 
universal course in form for everyone. The curriculum is highly individualized. And so um, the only reason I put Course of Miracles and, and on all the stuff that I've done is that that was a path that I happened to take along with what it is that we have found. Do you know what it is exactly that, is it like the soul that's awake, that, that's, that's not ready? That, what is it in us that, that suddenly finds this thing? What is it that suddenly wakes up? Well, you might say that, that when, they're, when you are finding something valuable and your heart's opening, that's, that's reflective of, since one mind is all minds, that's reflective of, of the state of openness the mind that's awakening. And when we seem to have partners or friends or people in our life that show up that seem to be resistant <coughs> to that, those again, if you bring it back to everything is mine, those are still, you could say, these are my own doubt thoughts being acted out. It's not really them that are not ready, but those are just aspects of, of saying, I'm not ready for the transfer to you know, sweep across my whole perception. So I've got an exception here, and maybe an exception here, an exception there, and that's just one's own nothings. So in my life, in the parable of David, you know, I started getting into all the metaphysics, going to course groups, and traveling, and yet I still would come back to the biological parents, Jack and Evelyn, and they would still be changing the subject. You know, I would talk about all the miracles, and they'd change the subject to the weather real quickly, or to the latest sports score, or the latest gossip about the family. And I said, but you don't understand, this is life holding. They, at one point, I think my, my mother, Evelyn, she, she looked at me and she said, I don't need a minister. I already have a minister. I don't, uh, I don't need the gospel according to you. <laughs> I don't need the gospel according to you. We've heard, we've heard the comments. And at one point, Evelyn, I was just like, I had so much joy coming out of me, I could almost like not hold it in. She just said, you need to find other people to share this with. And I thought, that's the Holy Spirit, right? It's to be heard now, because it was like, I think that's true. And so, so you start to realize that, that those are still the doubt thoughts, or the places where, the, where it hasn't completely transferred. And it, it really you can't understand it from a soul perspective, an individual soul perspective, because they really aren't individual souls. It's, the soul is like the spirit. But, but when you keep it simple and you just bring it back to, hmm, what is this reflecting to me? If you always keep it in that framework, what is this reflecting to me? Then, and you just keep opening, uh, then it takes the pressure off of the partner or the friend or the whatever. Uh, and you get into this glorious state where you realize that, that it's all you, so to speak, it's all mine, and that there's no one to convince about anything. And there's nobody that needs to get it or not. And some of those metaphors that were important to me early on when I was traveling was, I, I just want to be with people who are sincere, who really want to go deep, you know, those are my parameters. And I, of course, would get frustrated when somebody would come and want to talk about this or that, and I think, why did you send them uh, to the <laughs> gathering? But it was just, again, my own doubt thoughts getting acted out. And as soon as I let go of that, as soon as I really got happy, then I was really, I could be of service. I mean, you can't really be a miracle worker in, if you have doubts and fears. So as soon as I got happy, then I went around. I had no parameters. People could come and go as they want. I didn't receive any interruptions. I didn't perceive anybody getting it or not getting it or you know all those kind of things just started to get lifted from my mind and it was just like everybody became adorable uh, 
even the ones that were, I went through the Bible Belt and this young man, Rand, invited me to, to his, his parents' church, he invited all his family and friends down in Louisiana, and so I just showed up and just let it start ripping through me and everything, and they got on the topic of Jesus, and they seem to have very strong ideas around Jesus, and they seem to get louder and louder, and their faces start turning red, and they're amazing. <laughs> and, and, and tell you the truth, I was like, oh, I was just singing how adorable, it's just adorable. I said, look at how passionate they are for Jesus. I'm thinking, as the next veins are coming out and turning red, I had a wonderful time. Uh, the people, my, Carrie said she liked transcribing that. She said, I like when David goes down in those situations because it's, it's all real fiery. And I, I'm not talking about fire and brimstone. I'm just letting them pour through. But, but I just see it as kind of a, a unified perception. So I didn't perceive the anger or whatever. Uh, it just, to me, it was a very wonderful experience. And I just moved on. I was warned ahead of time that I could be tarred and feathered uh, if I would do this consistently <laughs> along the deep south, but I had no fear of tar and feather. Because that's everybody else, that, that isn't that everybody else's business, like it's my business, God's business, and then that and whoever else's business, whatever journey that they may take, and so the only business of mine can be exactly the same as the leg, is the experience of how I view that person that's not per se, going down the road that I want them to. So that's their business. And I have to stay out of that. And the only thing that I can do is choose a thing through the right mind. And I only have that as an experience. Otherwise, then that, that way it leaves the whole world to have the freedom to do the sudden, the whoever, to do whatever they want to do. Yeah, as they say, you're about the father of this story. When you're, when you're tuned in with God, Anything that's unlike God, you do just take a look at in terms of, of releasing it. Um, you don't you don't really point it out on. It's not even so much. At the beginning, I was thinking, well, everyone's just doing the best that they can, which was kind of a nice symbol to. I'm just doing the best that I can. And then the more that it started to kind of clear away, and I started to see. This dynamic of projection really was just an attempt to reject something from my own consciousness and see it outside as a trick, as if it was they or them doing it. Once I started to realize how silly that was, then, then it was just very attentive. I was very attentive to my thoughts. You know, the ones that were joyful and happy and free and gleeful, you know, those were, I would, I would align myself with those and the other ones, you know, it was like, no, that's, they don't serve me anymore. Mm -hmm. so, so it was a sense of like, just going where, I, I always just go where I'm invited. I had never a sense to, to go uh, to a, another place to try to heal somebody mm -hmm. or open up uh, a certain person or a group or whatever. I never saw it uh, that way. I just saw it as joyfully listening and following guidance for my own awakening. Not thinking of it as them so much. The thing is, with, with the partner, uh, is that you you are seeing you are actually on, and as you said, it could be your different world with whatever, and they are. But it doesn't work like that in the long run. It's just seeing them as perfect and beautiful, even though that. The stuff that's coming out of them before would have triggered and there would have been an anger or something. But it's it's just now, if, if you embrace that loving part, they change. If, if you just need if the experiences with love, it really does change the other person. And it cannot not be changed because you're not reacting how you work. They get very confused. It's it seems like they change, and then when you think, oh my gosh, my perception it's is changing. Right. That's yeah. right. Because people said that about my mother and father. But no, so. other people have said that he's changed too, you see. So and, and they're just reflecting. It's, it's yes. like it's all reflections of, yes, it of is. consciousness. Yes, it's it's it is. It's very empowering. It is empowering, because yes. I do think that the love and, and those positive vibrations really do encompass 
everyone needs it. Yeah. Yes, that's what it means in the Beatitudes, you know, in um, Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, you know, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And he talks about that in the Course. They're like overtaken with their strength. Strength and meekness are the same. And when you become so unified, you know, let thine eye be single, you're so unified in your purpose, it literally transfers to the whole world. All perception finally becomes turned around and cleared up. And so that's what it means that blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. They're inheriting it because they've changed their perception of it. And they've owned it in one sense, in a good sense. They've set up hurling things out and saying, I'm glad I'm not like that one, or I'm glad I'm not like that one. Some of those old things in the Bible, you know, but for the grace of God, there go I. It's like, thank you for the grace of God, there go I. You know, it's just, it slips the whole statement around from, you know, I'm glad I'm not like them to, oh, I'm exactly like that. I'm saying, thank God that I'm exactly like that. 